Whew, man. So there's three prayers that I've prayed. Well, two today that God has answered. And one through this season. And I just want to share those with you. Um, because God answers prayers. <laughs> sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes he does it right away. Uh, I just prayed that the Lord would just renew us this morning. As we gathered to worship him. And man, there, <laughs> that worship was good. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a gift from God. <laughs> that's an answer to prayer. And uh, we, we pray, you know, every, every year we pray for four of our missionaries in the season. And we gather a little collection for them. And just to kind of give them a little boost at the end of the year. And the whole season we're praying for them. If you notice through December, each week there was a different missionary that we highlighted that we were praying for. And we, and we took up a little collection for them. And this year, I don't know if you saw it when they flashed it on the screen, it was $12,680 that we gathered in a month for four missionaries to be, to be divided between those four missionaries, which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, think about this year. This year's been hard, and it's been, I mean, the last two years, really, but it's really been hard. It's been, I know if you're feeling like me, you just feel kind of like a heavy weight. And a lot of times what the tendency when people feel that way is to kind of withdraw and not kind of hold on to resources. And, and yet I think this is the most that we've ever, yeah. So Jack says, this is the most that we've ever collected for missionaries during that, the month of December in one of the, like the tail end of a really hard year. And that's, so that's a, that's an answer to prayer because God moves and opens our heart for generosity. And then the, the third one is a really silly one, but it's really, I think, profound um, about six months ago, my, my daughter lost her little animal that she sleeps with that's really nasty that, that you guys have seen. I used it as a sermon illustration at one point. I mean, it's so gross. She lost it, but Evie and I found it, but we decided not to give it back to her, so we hid it. And this morning, I was praying over my daughter. She came down. She was the first kid awake, and I was praying over her, and I just said, Lord, let her know how much you love her. And wouldn't you know it, she found that little thing. And as, soon, and as soon as she found, well, yeah, you can clap, but as soon as she found it, she said, it's a Sunday miracle. So I asked that God would let her know how much he loves her, and he did, even though I'm not really super happy about it. But those are three answers to prayer. God answers prayer. He moves. He is powerful. If we don't think of anything else through this morning, if you don't get anything else from this message, I just want you to hear that he is powerful. That his name is above all names. That Jesus Christ is our king. And that's a good summary of the message. I could almost close up the, the, the word and we can leave here, but I've, I've spent hours working on this, so we're going we're gonna to go through it. So let's, uh, well, that's a big water. Let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll jump right into the text. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word that reminds us of your power, that reminds us of your love for us through your son, Jesus. Open this word to our hearts, Lord, or open our hearts to this word that, that we would understand it and that it would take us and carry us through this week, through this month. Lord, remind us of how good you are, please. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I looked into the driver's eyes about 10 seconds before he smashed into the car in front of him. And there was that immediate smell of like antifreeze, you know, when a radiator gets busted up. And the, and the pieces of headlights and taillights that fell into the road. And then the, the dust and smoke from the airbags going off. All that stuff happened at exactly that same time. And, and, and I, I ran across the, the highway to check and make sure that that they were doing okay, that everybody in the car was okay, and, and everybody was fine and, and had to move, move their cars to the side of the road because it was a really busy stretch of the highway. And it was, it was afternoon rush hour, I-95, just south of Washington, D.C. If you're familiar with the area, you know how bad it is. And, and so we just tried to clear off the road. And I was working as a trooper in Virginia at the time, and I'd been called about three hours earlier to a wreck in that location because of the stop and go traffic. And, and it was typical of wrecks during that, like that time of the day. Most of the time they're fender benders. Somebody runs into the front of the back of them or the 
front end of the back end of a car because they're not paying as close attention as they should. They're, they're, they're stop and go traffic. They look away, look back, and the traffic has stopped and bam, into it. So a, a fairly quick accident, 20 minute accident, but I'd been there for three hours. Because the first accident that I got to set off a chain reaction of accident after accident after accident. Because people would look over and see what was going on on the side of the road. And they'd be looking at the accident, and then they themselves would get into an accident. And I had been doing that all afternoon. And the story was the same. And I could understand it. That commute, that 30-mile commute south of D.C. could take two to three hours every single day. And, and the monotony of driving and the same to stop and go and stop. And then an accident gives you something new to look at. Some, some bit of diversion or entertainment. And, and you for a second could look and, and see what's going on over there. And see, make sure everything's, everybody's okay. And that the police have it under, under control. And everything's great. And then look back and boom, you yourself. How many of you guys have ever felt that temptation as you're driving? Like to just kind of peek over at the accident I mean, we all fight it because it's something different. If you're on an interstate, you're just driving down. It's something different. It's, it's something out of the norm. It's, it's a diversion. It's a, it's a small picture, I think, of life. We, we like distractions. Things that will take us out of the normal, everyday stuff. I researched screen time this week just because I was curious about... Non-work-related screen time. Do you guys know what I mean when I say screen time? The, the amount of time we spend in front of screens throughout the day. And, and what's really funny is, one, there's really no, like, number out there. There's a lot of numbers. They're all pretty high and depressing. But especially during the last two years during COVID, those numbers, of, it's, nobody knows what people are doing. But the best number I could find was pre-COVID, 2016. It was a, a study by CNN, CNN that uh, they'd gotten from Nelson's ratings, and it measured all non-work-related screen time. And and they came up with a number of about 10 hours per day for an American average. That includes TV time, uh, and this is non-work-related. So there's TV time, you know, social media, text, checking emails, 10 hours. It's because we like... The distraction, it takes us kind of out of the moment, out of the grind of the day. Uh, the Wall Street Journal did a little study in some major city, and I didn't catch what city it was in. But uh, they, they, they put a guy dressed up like Chewbacca in the middle of the sidewalk, uh, in the middle of the day. And I mean, there's hundreds of people walking down the sidewalk. And, and they set up, and about 50 feet away, there was a, a, a news reporter with his, with his camera and his, and his little microphone and they, would, they just were watching people that were completely oblivious to this like seven foot Wookiee in the middle of the sidewalk. And, and people would come by and then the reporter would stop them and be like, hey, sir, um, just curious, did you notice Chewbacca back there? And the amount of people that did not notice this big furry Wookiee standing in the sidewalk was, was, there was one guy, he was on his phone, I think he was watching the show, and he walked up to Chewbacca. I guess he realized something was in his way and he kind of just, but never even noticed him. Because we want diversion. We want distraction. In the midst of everyday life, people want escape and entertainment. And we, we look for those things that might serve as that. Something is happening in the land of Israel. Something disruptive and different. Jesus has demonstrated his power and his authority and for the people who've been watching, who have seen what he's been doing and paying attention, Jesus is great. He is unique. He is ama- it, it is really awesome what's happening. And word spreads, as we see in verse 29. Word s- spreads and, and, and the crowd's growing. <clears throat> it's something we've seen. It's, it's something we've seen as we've gone through Luke. That the, that at, the longer Jesus spends in a time in, a, in an area, the more the crowds grow, the, the, the more people come to see him. The crowds increase. 
In the Gospels, which are the four written accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we see many different reasons for people coming to see Jesus. Some are desperate for help. It's the it's it's their last ditch effort. They don't have any other hope, so they come to him for help. Some are interested in his teaching. Some are trying to find ways to stop him. You know, they trick him or they ask him questions to try to to stymie him. And some are seeking the promised Messiah. But some, some it seems are there for for spectacle, for entertainment. And they want to see more. They they ask for more. They want to see signs. It, it, it scratches that itch of curiosity, or or it tickles that part of humanity, humanity that so desperately wants to be diverted. As their lives head for the crash further down the road, they're they're distracted by this momentary piece of entertainment. Jesus makes it very clear that what he's not doing is entertaining. This is more than a show that diverts attention. It is life rearranging, life changing. Entertainment engages our attention for a bit, distracts us. But then life moves on and we have to move with it. What Jesus is doing, what he's here to do, it changes life. How do we know this? Well, he tells us. He tells us over and over again. He shows us in small ways and in profound ways in the pages of of these books contained in this one book. He shows us over and over again. And if we aren't careful, we can get so used to hearing it that we kind of miss it. It just becomes white noise, static in the background that we can miss. And it becomes routine, and it's something we always do, and we can tune it out. And we can lose how life-altering what Jesus is doing actually is. Jesus isn't here just to entertain us. He is here for more. And if we we see this as just a form of, of diversion or entertainment, then we'll miss the point. When I was a kid, I used to sit in church with my grandmother, and I, I really didn't listen to anything that was going on in the worship service. I would read or, or just kind of tune it out uh, or draw on the bulletin or whatever. And so I, I, I wouldn't even really hear what's going on. And, and the first sermon that I remember was a sermon from Joshua. And I, I just remember uh, the, the, the preacher retelling the story of, of the conquest of Israel as, as Joshua and the armies came into Israel and they were, they were defeating the armies and they were taking over cities. And it was really, I mean, it was really interesting to a little boy. It was interesting to me. It was entertaining, but I knew there was a deeper, a deeper part to it, a deeper meaning to it. It was a picture of God's faithfulness for his people and that we have a God who can carry us through some of the most insurmountable battles in our lives. So I was entertained, but I knew that there was something more, something deeper. When we preach here, we want you to be engaged. We want you to be interested in what's, what's in these pages. We want you to, 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 to be entertained, to find interest in these pages. But there's something more. As we look at God's word, we want you to be shaped and changed. As a pastor, I want you to engage with God's word. I want it to direct your life. I want it to direct my life. I want to not just be here in the morning and and feel some kind of way like we do when God blesses us. I want to go from here and I want to I want to sit with God and I want to I want to 
be obedient and do the things he wants me to do and, and, and my life to be guided and, and shaped and rearranged. And I can say that in the moment. But that's a hard thing. Because it's more than just a diversion. It's more than just a distraction. Jesus rearranges all of our priorities. He rearranges all the things that we think hold importance and meaning. Just look at the first two verses of our text this morning. If you remember back, Jesus has cast out a demon from a man. He has demonstrated that he has power and authority over evil in this world. And he makes it clear that you can either follow him or leave yourself in the power of evil. This is several weeks ago we talked about this. To follow Jesus is to follow the real power behind the universe. If they really hear Jesus' words and see what he's done, then they will acknowledge that he's great. He's a great man doing great things. And there is a woman in the crowd who, who seems to understand this. She, she boldly speaks out, Blessed is the mother who gave birth, who gave you birth and nursed you. In the first century, one of the greatest things that can happen to a woman is to give birth to a great man. It's the way things were then. To, to be barren, if you look through the pages of Scripture, to be barren or not to have kids, that is shameful. It was, it was a woman's responsibility to bear a child. Everybody was expected of that. And to not was a shameful thing. And the best thing that could happen to a woman, well, there's two things. You could either be married to a great man or to give birth to a, a, man, a, a little boy that grows to be a great man. And those things gave you value in that time. And she's acknowledging how great Jesus is and then also how blessed his mom is because she's given birth to such a great man. Now I know that rubs against us a little bit, but that's how they thought. That's what they did. And if you look through the page of the screen, you can look and you can find that everywhere. And Jesus, he doesn't quite rebuke her, but he, he has a mild correction for her. It isn't a rebuke because what Jesus says is true. Mary, Jesus' mom, is blessed. If you look back in uh, Luke chapter 1, um, verse 48, it, Luke tells us she was blessed because she bore Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying she's not blessed, but he's correcting the way that she sees the world. And in that correction, he helps us to see the world a little differently. Jesus says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. You see, the woman in the crowd says that Mary's value is found in what she has done. Birth and raised a great man. But Jesus is saying that it isn't what gives, that's not what gives a person value. A woman's value isn't found in raising a great man. It isn't even found in, in having kids. What makes a woman and a person great is found in all, isn't found in all the markers that we tend to look at that, that point to greatness. None of those things make a difference. What really matters, what really signifies blessedness is a person whose life is shaped and directed by God. And often, those people aren't going to look like what we think a blessed person looks like. When you think of those who have it made, who are blessed, what do you think? What do you think about? You think about material things, right? A good house, a good job, lots of money, maybe good relationships. When's the last time you ever heard somebody refer to somebody that was homeless as, man, that guy's really blessed to be sleeping out on the street? It's because that's not how we equate blessedness. Think of it like this. If I'm trapped on a desert island, like shipwrecked on a desert, deserted island with no way off and there's no source of water on that island, what would it mean to be blessed? If a big pallet of money washed up on the shore and I had millions and millions of dollars, would you say I'm blessed? No, because that's not what I need. But if a, a big pallet of water washed up on the shore, like that would be a blessing, right? That would be, that would be something to say, yeah, blessed 
because it's something that I need. The same is true of us. We go through life pursuing all the things that we think give us a blessed life. But, but what, if, what if the things that we pursue with such great energy aren't the things that really matter? What if it's something different? We had a, we had a prayer meeting here on Friday night. Uh, in the sanctuary, and if the if you would have told me when I was 21 that I would spend a Friday night in my 40s at a church in a prayer meeting instead of a bar or a club, I would have told you you were nuts. Because the things I pursued as a 21-year-old that I thought were so important weren't and after the prayer meeting I, I was thinking about that and I was thinking man like it was really a, a rich time and Johnny Fine who was here he said there's no place I'd rather be on a Friday night than with you guys praying and I was like at first I was like oh but then the more I thought about it, I'm like he's right it's so good because my priorities changed in the 24 years since my early 20s. Jesus rearranges our priorities. What is important, it, it, it's changed. What are the things you pursue? What are the things you go after that maybe aren't that important? Jesus says that Everything we are looking for and everything we are wanting is found in Him. Everything that we need is found in Him. Those things that I was looking for in the clubs and the bars, they weren't found there. They weren't found until much later when I found Him, really found Him. In verses 29 and 30, just as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites of God's work in the world, so is Jesus. The things he does, the miracles, the teaching, they all give proof to who he is. But he, Jesus is the son. It's him. Jesus is God's work in the world. Jesus, God the son, here with us. And it's the relationship with him. There's another place in the Gospels. Gospel of John chapter 6 where the people ask for a sign. And uh, you know, Jesus has just gotten done uh, feeding 5,000 Pastor Joe pointed this out to me this week. Jesus has got, just got done feeding 5,000 people with just a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. And, and he's walked on water too. And the people come to him and they, they ask for another sign. And, and this is what John writes, and it's, it's fascinating because if, when you compare it to what we're talking about today. John chapter 6, starting in verse 28. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but is my Father who, gave, who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He is who we need. 
To believe in him is the work of God. And to come to him is to find all we need. In the Old Testament, God looks down on Nineveh and he determines that he's going to bring judgment against that city. They're, they're wicked. The evil, um, Jonah tells us, the evil has come up before God and he's going to bring judgment. And he sends Jonah to warn them. And, and when they hear the warning, it's, it's one of the best short little books in the Old Testament. When the, when the Ninevites hear Jonah's warning, they repent. They leave behind what they were doing, the, the evil and the wicked that they were doing, and they turn away from those evil pursuits, and God spares them. And now Jesus is here, greater than Jonah, verse 32. Greater than a prophet sent with a message of warning so that those people of Nineveh, Nineveh would be saved. That's because Jesus is salvation. It is in him that we can be saved. No other name, no other person, no other way. Jesus. When we turn from all of our, our pursuits toward him, all the ways we seek blessings in this world to him, they are contained in him. In one person, Jesus. We just need to stop pursuing those things and turn to him. And he'll show us the best way to live. He'll direct our paths that carry us into our lives. He'll give our lives so much more meaning. Another story from the Old Testament that we see in this passage is the story of Sheba, queen of the south. Here in this passage is what she's called in verse 31. She visited Solomon to gain wisdom. There are things that she wanted answers to. Um, we're told that she pondered questions. She, she wanted answers and she'd heard that Solomon was wise, that God had gifted him with wisdom supernatural wisdom and so she seeks him out and of course she finds that he is wise and she learns a great deal from him and now jesus is greater than solomon he is the wisdom of god he is the word of god john 1 1 through 2 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he jesus was the word. He can direct our steps. It is in him. When we come to him, we find uh, new life, new direction, new meaning. He changes us, transforms us, gives us hunger and passion and desire for more. And some days it's harder than others. I'm not saying that it's always like, you know, cotton candy and popcorn. Some days it's hard. But he changes us. And when we come to him, we find wisdom to live life the absolute best way we can. He saves us in the same way that Jonah's words saved the Ninevites. And Solomon's wisdom guided the queen of the south. I once read a story... This is in closing. I once read a story of a, of a well-known preacher whose church was in a kind of a middle class, as a middle class church, but they were in a, a really run-down part of town, a really poor part of town. And, and um, this preacher got criticized a lot because their, their church was kind of, you know, okay, very well to do, kind of middle class, but they didn't do a lot of outreach to people around the church building. And the, and the preacher got criticized for that, and, and he was convicted by that. And so he determined to change that, and he would go, uh, start taking a leader with him to go to different houses in the neighborhood to visit and see what the needs were and pray for people. And during the course of visiting a single mom who lived in a trailer just a little ways down from the church, um, they, they spent a, a good deal amount of time with her. And during the course of visiting with her, he presented Christ. And, sh and she, she came to Christ in that meeting. And it was really a cool little story. But the, the part that really got me that I, just sticks in my memory is he, he went back a couple days later to visit with her. 
just to do some follow-up, and she'd been crying. And he could tell that she was really just, really, like, hurt. And he asked her what, what was wrong. And she had, she'd been crying because she'd been talking to her sister. And her sister had told her something like this. And I'm trying to get it the best I can remember. Her sister told her this. She said, she said let me get this straight. The preacher said that someone like you could be saved. Someone who has done so many bad things and nasty things and terrible things. Someone like you can just repent and Jesus and trust Jesus and be saved. He told you that you don't have to live a good life. That you just have to turn to Jesus and be saved. That is too simple. I don't believe it. And neither should you. You see, her, her sister thought that salvation was something you had to achieve. That like all the other things that we seek for blessings in this world, that we have to earn it or hustle for it. Like everything else in this world, you just have to work your way into it. It couldn't be something freely given and that all you had to do was ask for it. But it is. Tim Keller, and it's a little Christmas devotion that he wrote, I don't know, four or five, six years ago. He says this about Christianity. He says, the Christian life begins not with high deeds and achievements, but with the most simple and ordinary act of humble asking. Then the life and joy grow in us over the years through commonplace Almost boring practices, daily obedience, reading and prayer, worship attendance, serving our brothers and sisters in Christ as well as our neighbors, depending on Jesus during times of suffering, and bit by bit our faith will grow and the foundation of our lives will come closer to that deep river of joy, a true blessing. Don't be put off by the ordinariness of the means of joy. For in that ordinariness is hidden the extraordinary riches of the gospel. Don't make the mistake that the world has always made. Instead, remember how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin... Where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Is this you? Are you living in this way? Trying to clean things up before you come to Jesus? Trying to get things straight? Trying to hustle to earn that blessing? Are you, are you pursuing value in some other areas? Instead of just coming to him. Or do you pursue the one in whom we live and move and have our being? You don't have to clean things up. You don't have to make things good and perfect. Or hustle to earn. You just have to turn to him and humbly ask him to save you. If you haven't, you can. It's very easy. You could do it today. If you have, then live your life in pursuit of him. The ordinariness of a life lived with him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We pray that you would help us to see you that we would pursue you and obey you and have our life shaped by you and in that in the ordinary things such as obedience and prayer and and reading of your word and 
serving our neighbors and our brothers and sisters and even leaning on you in those times when we're really hurt and really devastated. That you would grow in us a deep well of joy that anybody could say, blessed are you because we follow the one, Jesus Christ, in your holy name, amen.